Hello, good evening, everybody. And uh, we invite you to the first ever um, distinguished lecture series by Oculoplastics Association of India. We are very honored and very fortunate to have with us Dr. Robert Goldberg, who is an internationally recognized surgeon, researcher, and teacher who has developed numerous surgery, both in thyroid disease, or orbital cancer, aesthetic. He was a past president of ASOPERS, and today we have him with us to speak on fibrosis in thyroid eye disease. So at the outset, I would like to welcome the president of OPAI. Let me share my screen. Yeah. I'd like to invite the president of OPAI, Dr. Subhas Bethelia, like who needs no introduction, who had done his master's from AIMS and presently is a director of the Visitec Eye Center New Delhi, having more than 35 years of teaching experience with lots of national and international publication, awarded the prestigious Parasnat Sinha Gold Medal and the CS Rashmi Award. And he is in the board of directors of International Oculoplasty Society of USA since 1980s. Then along with me, Dr. Milin Knight, he'll be moderating the session. And he also needs no introduction. He's a consultant in the Department of Optimal Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at LBPA Hyderabad. And we'll be having lots of questions. And already we received a few questions like, is it um, uh, live on YouTube and Facebook? Yes, OPI has a Facebook page, OPI has a YouTube link. And I'm very much honored to introduce the three dynamic panelists, Dr. Surya Natharat. He is the uh, consultant and director at the Optimally Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Department at Bhuvaneshwar LBPI campus. And it's to his credit and both Milan and Surya, they're the editors of the textbook titled The Surgery in the Thyroid Eye Disease. He has done great researches, had received funding from Bayer, which is a very prestigious funding for his work in oculoplasty. Then we have a dynamic treasurer, Savari, who is a consultant at PDAPD Hinduja, Mumbai. And she is also a past fellow of LV Prasad Eye Institute, has received numerous awards nationally, internationally, the AO Award, the ASOPERS uh, Award, the APAO Award. And we have Dr. Roshmi, who is also a past fellow of LVPI. Who, who was the first one to start Oculoplasty service in Karnataka in RN Netralaya, trained multiple fellows, has got lots of national and international uh, lectures and also publication. So over to you, Milin, now I request you to introduce Professor Goldberg and then we go to his lecture. Kasuri, we might just ask uh, Professor Betharia to just say two words and inaugurate this. Yes lecture series. Dr. Betharia. Thank you very much, Dr. Milen. Uh, is my voice clear? Yes, it is. Uh, I welcome you all to the Distinguished Lecture Series, which is starting today with the great effort of Dr. Kasturi and Dr. Milen and my ABLE team. I. Uh, Welcome, Dr. Robert, Professor Robert Goldberg. To have, have you, Dr. Professor Robert Goldberg, to deliver uh, your uh, first distinguished lecture of the series. I welcome you all, and you can go ahead with your lecture now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Betheria, being with us while you are recovering from COVID, and it really means a lot to us. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, my teacher and mentor, Professor Robert Allen Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg is a graduate from Stanford University, and thereafter his medical school, his residency, as well as his ASOPRIS fellowship was from UCLA under the preceptorship of Norman Shore. He also did an orbital fellowship under the guidance of Jack Rootman and John Wright. He has to his credit, the Burt Levy Endowed Chair in Ophthalmology. He also is the Chief of Orbital and Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery Division at UCLA. He has contributed in several capacities to the advancement of the ASOPRIS and also the ASOPRIS Fellowship as well as the International Fellowship. He has been the president of ASOPRIS 
the president of the board of California Association of Eye Physicians and Surgeons, been on the editorial board of several important ophthalmology and ophthalmic plastic surgery journals, and the two most coveted awards by the Aesopus Lester Jones Anatomy Award and the Henry Bailey's Award. He is at his best when he's teaching, whether it's clinic or the OR, and whether you have a fellow or an observer or an international visiting scholar, they are always mesmerized by the amount of knowledge he has to share with us. His program, the master's course on several aspects of orbit as well as aesthetics, they sell out like hotcakes and it's a very popular program. His international as well as the Aesopras Fellowship program is one of the most sought after, not only in the US but across the globe. And uh, there is a plethora of very well accomplished fellows he has trained in every continent and most of the countries. He is not a stranger to India and he has contributed in several ways in several of our All India Ophthalmic as well as the Oculoplasty conferences. And if there is something that I uh, particularly uh, remember learning from him which completely changed the way I look at ophthalmic plastics is the different way that he thinks compared to everyone else. And that exactly brings us to today's topic that is fibrosis in thyroid eye disease. I think we all look at it like an inflammatory disease, but his view and take on this is very interesting. And our panelists, Savri Roshmi and Surya will moderate it. So without further ado, over to Dr. Goldberg. Thanks very much, Melinda. I, I'm here with, uh, actually we have two of our, two of our fellows, Kelsey Roloffs is, is here with me. And uh, I'm gonna ask our global fellow, the fellowship now, Melinda, is the global fellowship, not the international fellowship. That was Dr. Leibowitz's idea. So the, our global fellow, uh, Pallavi Singh, who many of you already know, is going to uh, start by sharing a case with us. Are you seeing my slides? Yes, we do. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so very good. I, so it, as you said, Melinda, what I'm going to try to do is to maybe shift your thinking a tiny bit about thyroid eye disease, because I'm I really over my career, I've taken care of so many patients. And I'm starting to see the disease from a little different direction. Now. Uh, I certainly want to thank Casturi and Melind for yeah, inviting a, our UCLA group to participate in the meeting. And uh, here's Melind getting his diploma from his fellowship time at, at UCLA. And some of my many uh, successful meetings, I'm sorry that I can't be in India in person, but pretty soon we'll all be back in person, I look forward to that. So Pallavi, I'm gonna ask you to uh, start by presenting a case for everybody. Thank you so much and good evening everybody. So uh, to begin with, we want to talk about this 57 year old man who in fact just presented to our clinic last week. And he just had complaints of vertical diplopia which he developed in the past two months, no complaints of pain or redness. He was a smoker. And when he was tested uh, for thyroid, his labs got done. He was diagnosed with raised thyroid antibodies, low TSH levels, and he's currently on 10 milligrams of methamazole. He started treatment for thyroid eye disease. And uh, on examination, his vision was 2030 on the right, 2025 on the left. Anterior and posterior segment examination was fairly normal. No gross proptosis on examination by hotels. However, as you can see here, he had right hypertropia of about 40 uh, prism diopters, and there was se a severe limitation of superduction uh, in, the right, in the left eye. As you can see here, he was using his left eye, which was his dominant eye, and that led to like a severe um, secondary deviation in the right eye. So it, he presented with vertical diplopia. So here's a patient who basically comes in with double vision without going through any of the classic inflammatory stages of the disease, right, Pallavi? Yeah. 
And we have a picture of his MR scan, which was done. And you can see that on the left, there's a slightly inflamed and enlarged superior rectus. And the other extraocular muscles seem fairly normal. So I, I, let's think about that case for a second with the enlarged muscle, but not really any other features of thyroid eye disease, such as redness, inflammation, uh, chemosis, pain. And I'm gonna ask you first, Melinda, to tell me who, who originated the grading system for thyroid eye disease? Who'd you guess, Melinda? Well, I would credit it to Moritz, the- Maybe uh, Moritz or Corny or Cornif. Well, yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, I, I think it was probably, I was Cornelius Celsus who originated it in 25 AD. By the way, I got out Celsus book as I was preparing this lecture. And if you're ever really, if you're ever bored, you should read it because it's fascinating to see how he saw medicine 2000 years ago. And one of my favorite chapters is on Chalasia. And it's so funny because he, he describes Chalasian the same way that I do in my textbook. He, he, he gets the clinical history exactly right. And he says he's tried everything, but the only thing that really works is warm compresses. And so he was a pretty smart person. And as you know, he's the one who I think uh, is, is credited with originating our ideas about inflammation. And in Latin, his words, calor, rupert, tumor, and dolor, I assume are taught in India just the same way they're taught of here, the features of inflammation. And in fact, all of our grading systems, and, and you're right, Melinda, you know, Martin Moritz uh, gets a lot of credit for developing the CAS score, which has become a, a standard grading measure. But other people, Jack Rootman, Jane Dixon, Dickinson, uh, many people have, have tried to come up with grading systems. And if you look at these, they, they all tend to focus on the inflammatory features of the disease, the redness, the pain, the swelling. And one of the reasons is, you know, that's the striking part of the disease, right? It's the part that we can see there, these things are easy to recognize and, and measure. And I think maybe just as important, they respond probably the best to treatment. And in fact, if you look at almost any of the treatments that we've looked at over the years from radiation to all the different immunosuppressive medications, the one thing they tend to do best is treat the inflammatory features. They're all very good at that. But what I'm gonna ask you to do is to think about the morbidity of thyroid eye disease for a second. And I, I think all of you like me have a collection of patients in your practice with thyroid eye disease. So you've seen this disease a lot. Is the inflammation really the morbidity of the disease? Well, it's often what brings patients in to see us, right? The pain and the redness are often what they notice first. It's annoying for sure, but the inflammation is effectively treated with anti-inflammatory medications. And with time, we've all been fascinated in thyroid eye disease by the tendency for the inflammation to resolve for it to run a course. It's not that common in autoimmune disease. This is a patient that I've, I've always liked this story. Uh, he came in, referred, helicoptered in from another hospital because his infectious uh, orbital cellulitis wasn't responding to IV antibiotics. And when he came in the door, the first year fellow recognized an obvious case of thyroid eye disease with the typical eyelid retraction. And here he was after five days of IV steroids, just a, a dramatic, you know, sometimes the inflammatory presentation is dramatic. And this case just demonstrates how quickly it responds in almost all cases to uh, immunosuppression. So I would argue that the inflammation is not really the morbidity of the disease. Now, is it the optic neuropathy? Well, that always catches everybody's attention. And in many grading scales, optic neuropathy is at the top of the pyramid. 
is the most severe part of the disease. But I'm gonna tell you after, I don't know, Paul, if I treated maybe two or maybe 3,000 patients now with thyroid eye disease. And in my whole career, I think maybe I've had one or two patients permanently lose significant vision from the optic neuropathy. Permanent symptomatic loss of vision is uncommon. And the, th and the optic neuropathy responds particularly well to medical or surgical treatment. You know, decompression is usually somewhat miraculous. It's one of our most gratifying orbital surgeries. It, I, I hope some of you've had the experience of decompressing a patient with optic neuropathy and having them wake up in the recovery room able to see colors again. It, it's, it, it's often dramatic. And the same thing with medical treatment. Often uh, the neuropathy responds very well to medical treatment. So I don't think optic neuropathy is really, certainly it's uh, frightening to the patient and the doctor, certainly it should be treated. But by the way, not necessarily emergently, because I've seen patients with, with decreased vision for weeks or even months come back essentially to normal. I'm not saying to be cavalier and wait, but you don't need to take the patient to the operating room that night. The nerve is resilient to the optic neuropathy. And you know, I'll say again, I've just had very, very few patients permanently lose vision from optic neuropathy. So I don't think this is the main morbidity of the disease. I think it's treatable. So Castor is thinking, well, what about the proptosis and the disfigurement. Well, for sure, you know, these patients are often young patients in the prime of their life. And when they look in the mirror and see the changes of the disease, it, it's a, it's a, I'm very sympathetic to them you know, over the years. I really think I've grown to understand how discouraging and depressing it is to see this change in the appearance that occurs from the disease. But the proptosis actually improves slowly over time and it responds very well to orbital decompression surgery. And as we'll talk in a moment to some of the newer medical treatments as well, perhaps. We've gotten very good at staged surgical rehabilitation. And I'd say in most cases, we can successfully bring these patients back close to their pre-morbid appearance. And so I would argue that the proptosis is not the worst morbidity of the disease. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of warning that comes with gray hair. Now that I start to see some of my own patients coming in 10 or 20 or dare I say 25 or 30 years after I treated them surgically, what I see now is some of my patients coming in like this with late enough thumbs. You know, we lose volume as we age. Kester, you've given beautiful lectures about that. And so nowadays when I decompress young patients, I'm more conservative than I used to be. My goal is no longer to get them right back to where their pre-morbid state is, but maybe to leave a little bit of room for the volume loss that occurs over age. So I've argued against inflammation, optic neuropathy, and proptosis being the worst morbidity of thyroid eye disease. And that leaves us with the strabismus. And I'm here to argue that the fibrosis and strabismus is the most disabling sequela of thyroid eye disease. Right? It's the most disabling sequela, the incapacitating diplopia is really what wrecks patients' lives, keeps them from driving, from reading, from their daily function. And this is a patient that, that Pallavi is actually helping me take care of right now, who is maybe the worst fibrotic patient that I've had in thyroid eye disease, who came in with, with just intractable proptosis. And interestingly, her imaging has shown some diffuse fibrosis in the orbit. So she almost crosses the boundary into a, a mix of thyroid eye disease and sclerosing orbital inflammation. 
but she's just been recalcitrant to treatment uh, of any type. Nowadays, when I do decompression uh, for the worst cases of thyroid eye disease, I take the uh, bone all the way back to the dura. This is a case that our fellow Kelsey recently did. She loves using the drill. And Kelsey, I think you did a nice job on this decompression because here you can see that you've, you've taken the uh, entire sphenoid out and, and we're just looking at the middle cranial fossa dura. But even with that aggressive decompression back to the cranial fossa, this patient really didn't get much proptosis reduction. And that's because this orbit is so fibrotic that the, it's just become incapacitated. So let's talk for a moment about the fibrosis in thyroid eye disease and where it comes from. If you'll accept my thesis that the fibrosis is the most disabling, it's the worst morbidity of the disease. Rundle got a lot of mileage out of a paper that's actually very mediocre if you go back and look at it. But I do think that we credit him for first observing this fascinating part of the thyroid eye disease clinical presentation, which is that it goes through this inflammatory phase. And then it seems the inflammation seems to quiet down, at least a, a, according to Celsius, right? Because the dolor and the rubor and the and it, the all the all the features of inflammation seem to disappear over six to 24 months. But here's the question that I've really been asking myself for years now. Does treating the classic inflammation really reduce the fibrosis? Because that's the story that we hear in the book, right? We, in the book, they show us Rundle's curve and, they, and Melinda, I've heard you give a lecture and you, and, and you have a little arrow in the inflammatory phase and you say, here, if we shorten the inflammatory phase, we reduce the fibrosis, right? And there's a little bit of evidence in other autoimmune disease like scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, that early aggressive treatment seems to reduce some of the late features. But I'm starting to get more and more skeptical that treating the classic inflammation really reduces the fibrosis. Because I've had so many patients over the years that even after aggressive corticosteroid therapy with the inflammation resolving, they either don't improve or sometimes progress in terms of their strabismus, right? Surya Santa, haven't you seen that in your patients, patients that, that regress after steroid treatment? Well, I would say they do, uh, but Some, not least, to the extent that we would like them to. Yeah, sometimes. But right, look, there's patients with mild disease that get better, right? We all see that, you know, where they go through the course and then the double vision goes away and that's very gratifying. But I definitely see a group of patients that don't, where the inflammation responds, inflammation responds almost 100% to any, any type of, you know, immunosuppression, but not always the double vision. And on the flip side of that coin, we already had you know, a very nice uh, case presentation from Pallavi of a patient that, and we've reported several of these now, who present, never have any Celsius type inflammation at all, and just present with, with fibrosis. So fibrosis, I don't think is just an automatic endpoint of the typical Celsius inflammation. This is just another typical case of a quiet presentation, never having any inflammatory features, but look on this top picture of her trying to look up. She's so tight in terms of the eye muscles. I don't pretend to really understand the molecular biology of the disease. And in fact, every time I think I get a grasp of it, someone comes up with some new marker or, or genetic marker of the disease to confirm my inability to keep up with this rapidly evolving field. But one of the things that I do take home from my understanding of, of, of so many groups that have done marvelous work on the molecular biology 
is that a common thread is that fibrosis may have independent molecular pathways. Right? So much research seems to show that based on you know, the, the cytokine or the genetic pathway of the month, that there's some features that, that signal the cellular differentiation either into a non-fibrotic or a fibrotic pathway. And CAS grading, and as I said earlier in the lecture, our, our standard grading scales may not be that sensitive to fibrosis because our grading scales are mostly inclined towards the inflammatory phase of the disease. So if you accept my hypothesis that fibrosis is a significant morbidity of the disease, then how can we measure fibrosis and identify patients at risk for developing more fibrotic disease? It'd be nice one day if we have a, a, a biomarker. And we're, I, sometimes I think we're getting a little closer to that. But until we have a biomarker, I think the only good proxy that we have or the most sensitive proxy is the double vision. So how can we actively or accurately measure uh, motility in a way that can be sensitive to fibrosis? Well, the field of binocular vision is a good test. And I don't do that with the uh, Goldman perimeter, but I, I measure it just with, with, with ductions and try to get their tunnel of single vision on every visit. The HESS screen is another test that can be very helpful. And at UCLA, we, we do have the ability to do the HESS screens. Uh, it's biased by functional amplitude. So it may not be as physio, it may not tell as much what the patient experiences, but it's accurate and repeatable. Uh, certainly diplopia questionnaires are very helpful. And that's what has been used, for example, in some of the tepertumumab studies. And duction testing, if done accurately, can be helpful. And by the way, you know, one of the ways I think that duction testing is very helpful is just taking the pictures. And Melinda, I hope you do, do you take the pictures in gaze positions like I taught you in your charts. If I come visit you, will I see that? Yes, you will. Good. Because I think that's actually, it's objective. You can look at it you know, in research afterwards. I think that's one very useful way. You can also try to measure it with some of the different measuring systems that have been developed. But in however you do it, I, I would ask you, especially if you're involved in clinical research, to keep track of motility and strabismus status in all patients with thyroid eye disease so that we can better study them. And as I said earlier, there's some nascent biologic markers that look like they may be useful. And of course, as the experts in molecular biology get closer perhaps to understanding the exact pathways that lead to fibrosis. They also may be able to help us with biomarkers that we can use to identify patients at risk. But I think we should be paying attention <laughs> to antifibrotic therapy from other disciplines. For example, there's a, a lot of work being done on scleroderma and pulmonary fibrosis looking at inhibitors of fibrosis, like the micro RNA 21 targets. There's been some good work on nitantinib, uh, pyrfetinone, and rapamycin serolimus, which are long-standing chemotherapeutic agents. And I, I suggest that we should look at any promising antifibrotic therapies to see if they're applicable to the fibrosis of thyroid eye disease. So in that regard, you, one of the sea changes that has occurred in the United States in the management of thyroid eye disease over the past couple of years has been the development of the IGF-1 blockade. Melin, you were at UCLA when Ray and Terry were working on this in the laboratory, Ray Douglas and Terry Smith. And I think it's really one of the Cinderella bench to bedside stories of this century, because uh, from the laboratory, the treatment has turned out to be such an uh, amazing biological approach to thyroid 
eye disease. And in particular, what we've been seeing from many of the studies that are coming out now is that the motility and strabismus really do seem to improve Relative, certainly relative to baseline and also relative to classic uh, immunosuppression like corticosteroids, for example. You know, essentially from about one third response with, with corticosteroids to a two thirds response with tepertumumab. And interestingly, it's not just the clinical motility that improves, but many studies now, including one that we just published are showing that the eye muscles actually gets smaller you know, with uh, echography or MR scanning. So that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating finding. And it makes me believe that whether it turns out to be IGF-1 blockade or maybe some other pathway that, you know, we're working on a lot of different pathways now that we're understanding molecular biology better that there may be ways to biologically uh, block the fibrotic pathways. And by the way, just to give you an update on tepertumumab, uh, because I think, Castor, do you have it in India now? I've, I've heard that it's, it hasn't gotten to India yet. Do you, do you have availability of no. tepertumumab no. yet? No, it's not available in India. Not yes. yet. Yeah. So, so let me tell you what we're seeing. So it's an IV infusion, eight sessions over three months. Now it's unclear if it's durable or needs a repeat. When it was marketed, it was marketed as being a one-time treatment. Uh, and it, at least with a couple of year follow-up, it seems that some patients after one course don't need any more. Now, maybe they just had a short Rundle's curve. It's hard to know. But some patients we're seeing now don't have a durable response. They need repeat treatments. And it may be that in a group of patients, you just need chronic maintenance with tepertumumab. Fortunately, in, in all of our post-marketing studies, severe side effects are rare. Uh, maybe the most worrisome of, of something that could be permanent is hearing loss. Uh, patients do get disacusis from the treatment occasionally. But fortunately, it seems like most of these have been temporary. But we're, we're trying to study that to see if there's a group that's, that's uh, susceptible to permanent hearing loss. And the best data is for the active disease, because that's what most of the studies are stuck on for reasons that I already, already told you. Our, our grading scales mostly look at, the, at the, the activity the CAS improves in almost everybody. But the interesting thing is that the proptosis improves in about 80% of patients as opposed to steroids were never great at proptosis. And the motilities I said improves in about two thirds. Most of the steroid studies, including all the UGOGO IV steroid studies show somewhere more in the range of 30%, rarely 60% for the steroid studies. And the muscles got smaller, as I said. There have been no randomized studies yet for late disease or optic neuropathy, but we're seeing more and more post-marketing series published that uh, it may be useful for late disease. And there's a, a currently an ongoing uh, long-term trial to look at the use of tepertumumab in post-inflammatory disease. Or, and actually a lot of anecdotal and short series have shown that it's very effective for optic neuropathy which isn't surprising based on what I said earlier because optic neuropathy tends to respond well to any treatment. So it's a very promising new medicine. And, and by the way, behind tepertumumab, there's a train of other IGF-1 receptor uh, inhibitors. The, in, the results of this have been so good that every drug company in, in America, probably in India also, is jumping on the bandwagon and trying to come up with their own IGF-1 inhibitors. So I think we'll see a lot of these over the next five years. It's profoundly expensive. I never dreamed that a medicine could cost half a million dollars, but that's what a, a treatment course costs, three to $500,000. 
And because of that cost, right now I'm using it mostly for severe cases, unresponsive to traditional treatment, but we're very excited about this. It really looks like it might be uh, a game changing treatment for thyroid eye disease. And most important, I think that it might be a treatment for the fibrotic part of the disease and a signal, a signal that maybe in the future, as we understand the molecular biology of the disease better and better, that we'll be able to find targets for those fibrotic pathways and really improve our patient's quality of life. So I think Pallavi wanted to finish with one uh, case, one, one last case uh, to show an anecdote of some of, some of our uh, more encouraging experiences with tapertumumab. So this is just a clinical example to elucidate what Dr. Borberg was talking about. This was, again, a 57-year-old male who presented with mild inflammatory symptoms, but his main symptom was diplopia. He was diagnosed with grave disease, had a low TSH, and was started on medication for that. And so you can see here, this is uh, the top picture is, in fact, him trying to look up. And he had severely limited superduction. Vision was fairly normal. Uh, he did not have a very significant proptosis, only about two millimeters, but he did have an esotropia of about 14. It says Tupere was about 14 in distance. And he had limitation of superduction and limitation of abduction on the right. And this is his, uh, these are his clinical photographs. So he really has almost no he, up he, gaze. He has almost no up gaze. It was about five degrees, as you can see here. Even on the left gaze, the abduction was uh, fairly limited on the left. And so he underwent uh, eight infusions of tapratumumab. Now there was a significant uh, improvement in his motility. It was this, so this is his, uh, um, you know, primary gaze and even- And you can see by the way, you know, the inflammation has also and the resolved. swelling definitely right. improved, which is not unique, but yeah, tapratumumab is very good for that, just like all, any immunosuppression thyroid disease. And so what was interesting was that even though his motility had not completely gotten back to normal, his uh, field of single vision is what we were talking about, which is uh, the most important factor when it comes to Function. daily activities, functionality of these patients. That had improved a lot. So it just goes to show what Dr. Gorba was talking about. Dan Rutman would be very annoyed at us showing that uh, anecdotal case because you know, we're always inclined to pick our best ones, but at least that kind of response is, is, is not all that uncommon for tepertumumab. And at least based on our early anecdotal reports and also a short series that we just published, a retrospective series. But I'm just here to tell you after you know, seeing every medicine for my whole career, this has been the most encouraging that I've seen. Melinda already bragged about our, our courses you know, I, I don't get any money from these. In fact, they cost me money, but we really enjoy these courses because they're master's courses. We get people, experts from all over the world. And so we actually learn as much as we teach. Uh, we just decided to cancel our March meeting, uh, Melinda, yesterday because it's just too hard for people to travel to the United States right now. So we're going to do it uh, next March, which gives everyone... Uh, 13 months to get ready to come out, but we'd love to see a lot of people from India at our uh, master's dissection symposium. So to summarize what we've talked about, Kasturi, fibrosis, in my opinion, is the most important cause of disability in thyroid eye disease. I think that our classic conception that, that clinically visible Celsius type inflammation leads to fibrosis. It may be oversimplified. It, it may be a side effect of just the way that we've seen the disease clinically where many patients get inflamed and many patients get fibrotic disease. But I want you to consider the possibility that biologically, these are essentially separate pathways. And if fibrosis has a separate independent pathway, we should utilize grading systems and outcome measures that are sensitive to measuring the fibrotic changes. In my opinion, the holy grail of thyroid eye disease is to identify patients who are gonna go on and have bad fibrotic disease. Because if we could identify those, 
hopefully with a, a serum you know, or a biologic marker, then we could treat them aggressively and treatments should be evaluated with regard to their ability to limit or even improve the fibrosis. I, I hope that that's uh, is, is, you know, at least giving you an idea of how I think about thyroid eye disease right now. I hope it's a useful lecture for your group in India. And uh, Kelsey and Pallavi and I would be glad to, to take any questions. Here, Kelsey, you can be part of the panel. That is one of the best presentation on thyroid diabetes. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg, so much. I just have a question to you. Like, we do not get tiprotumumab in India. So what can be the next line of management? What do you suggest for us in, in, uh, in India for the fibrotic thyroid eye disease? Uh, first of all, I, I do think that the IGF-1 inhibitors are going to uh, you know, be more available, come down in price. So I think you know, hopefully you'll have access to them soon. But in the meantime, I think that the... Uh, IV or, or pulse steroids, either IV or, or high dose, you know, pulse oral steroids, I think still have a, a reasonable role, the, the typical UGOGO treatment. And then in terms of immunosuppressant, I still use tocilizumab as my choice for more severe cases. But I have to be honest, Kester, I, I don't think that there's great evidence for one immunosuppression over another. The CERTED trial was a little disappointing for azathioprine, although I still think that's a reasonable, inexpensive medication to use. Uh, rituximab is, a, is probably the, the second line that I would use after tocilizumab. But again, with rituximab, there have not been uh, great results in terms of fibrosis in, in many of the uh, retrospective studies that have come out. And finally, I think there's pretty good evidence for low dose radiotherapy uh, in terms of motility. You know, the, the randomized trials that came out of Amsterdam were encouraging in that regard. And then there have been a few more anecdotal studies that have suggested that and I think the morbidity of low dose radiotherapy is low. So in summary, I think that the, the classic immunosuppressive triad of high dose steroids, uh, steroid sparing agents such as azathioprine and low dose radiotherapy are the, are the triad of treatment that, that is most appropriate for fibrotic disease. But I'll ask, you know, I, I, I mostly go to these meetings to learn from you because your experience is so Rich, uh, do you have any different perspective based on the patients you see in India? Um, Dr. Goldberg, like what I've seen that, yes, uh, in India also people start with IVMP, like the steroids and rituximab, but also I have seen many people prefer my, uh, mycophenolate mofetil, and they feel that this mycophenolate mofetil not only helps in the acute phase, but also in the chronic phase of the disease. And not very sure, but uh, many of the endocrinologists, and even we, like when we ask endocrinologists to treat the thyroid eye disease, so that is what many people in India are uh, taking it as a first line of treatment, a combination of the glucocorticoids and the mycophenolate mofetil. That's interesting. And cell sept is, uh, has a good safety profile. It's, it's, yes. it's usually well tolerated. Very and good. it is quite cheap in India and quite available. So we, Kasuri, yeah. we do have a couple of questions in the admin yes. panel, as I can read. And but before, before that, that I have to mention, like Dr. Goldberg, you have done an amazing, like so many people are online, near, nearly 200 people are online, and lots of them are YouTube having lots of questions. Thank you so much for honoring us by being with us today. Milin, go ahead to the questions. Uh, the panelists, Roshmi, Sabri, Surya, do you all have any comment while I'm just, you know, going through the questions? I have four questions as of now. Um, uh, 
I'll, I'll uh, Melinda, Dr. Goldberg, uh, uh, very thought provoking and uh, thanks. Uh, I'm glad uh, you gave this lecture. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you one question and sort of draw a parallel between uh, the extra, let's say the strabismus extraocular muscle and again, retraction and the levator muscle. Now I'll just, uh, the question I have is, uh, there are reports in the literature of uh, objectively looking for, uh, with the help of uh, MRI at the signal intensity. And in fact, also in the signal intensity ratios and comparing with, with the temporalis or cerebral cortex. So uh, from what we know that the, if you on the MRI images, if you have a high ratio, they are, they are suggestive of, uh, uh, of uh, tissue edema or which is again, uh, a marker for inflammation. So the question I have is, is it possible that uh, when we differentiate predominantly fibrotic disease, it's a scenario where the inflammation is restricted to the muscle and does not spill over into the orbit compared to a scenario where you have a soft tissue inflammation, which we capture with either of a CAS or any other scoring systems. So that's an interesting question, Sir Sonata, and I think that that could be. The MR markers that you're talking about really pick up edema. Celsus would be proud, right? It's one of, the, one, one of his features of swelling, rubor. But I'm not convinced that, that they really teach as much about the fibrosis because, as I was saying, I'm no longer convinced that fibrosis is a direct result of that classic and inflammatory cascade. Now, your question as to whether differential involvement in muscles is a to the rest of the orbit. Uh, yes, I think that that's, that's possible. One of the things that we're understanding is that the tissue that's involved in the orbit, it, it seems like it might be the fibroblast itself, which is distributed you know, throughout the tissues in the fat and the muscle. It's the differentiation of those fibroblasts that may be causing the fibrosis. Uh, so the other explanation for the phenomenon that you're seeing is that that swelling is just a, a byproduct product of the inflammatory pathway, but that's what's going on in the fibrosis may not be reflected in the imaging. Roshmi or Savri, you have any, any comments? Should I go? Uh, yeah, Roshmi. Hello, Dr. Goldberg. It's such yeah. a privilege to listen to you. Uh, Dr. Goldberg, this is what I wanted to ask you. Uh, do you see a different temporal pattern in fibrosis patients? Uh, for instance, apart from lacking the obvious inflammatory appearance, in some of my patients, I've noticed that the ones who go in for this kind of a fibrotic uh, endpoint, they progress towards diplopia much faster than the other patients. It happens almost within, you know, days or weeks rather than slowly. So is there a way if we track the temporal progress of the patient and we see it's progressing faster instead of staying on pulse methylprednisolone, add on low dose uh, radiation or mycophenolate right at the beginning before it gets too bad? Right. Well, you're preaching to the choir, Rashman, that you know, my whole conception of how we should manage this disease is to identify those patients at risk and then treat them aggressively with the best treatments we have now and hopefully in the future we'll have better treatments. But I also, if, if, if I heard correctly, you just volunteered to study those patients since you have a collection of them and We'll look forward to the uh, abstract for next year's meeting. Is that what I is that what did I hear you correctly? <laughs> well, Dr. Goldberg, you're very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shall I take up a question from the audience? 
Yes, Milindo. So, so Dr. Deepankar Das from uh, Guwahati, he is asking that uh, it's the immunological reaction in thyroid eye disease involves both T and B cells. So, in the fibrotic component, which is the sequelae of chronic stage, do you anticipate more B cell manifestation in pathological samples than the T cells? That's the question. Hell of fine. Do we know that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think that's a great that's a great question. But you know, do you know do you know how it answer that, Melinda? I think ten or twelve, ten or fifteen years ago, I would have professed some you know, really really cheeky answer based on everything I know about T and B cells. But as I get older, I get more and more humble when it comes to guessing the immune system, it really is like peeling an onion, right? Every time you think you understand it, you, you peel it off and you realize there's another layer. And so it, it may be a lot of hubris to think that we can you know, outguess the immune system and understand, well, say T and B cells. It may be a very immature understanding of what's really going on, but I don't have a good, it's a good question. I, I don't have a, a really good answer for that. Right. He he also asks if uh, if the uh, orbital fat in fibrosis behaves differently with the rest of the adipose tissues in the body. Uh, that's that's such a good question that we're studying that right now. We've been harvesting uh, abdominal tissue and orbital tissue and trying to look at uh, single cell RNA markers. To, to try to understand if, if the cells are phenotypically behaving differently. But we don't have an answer for that right now. Um, the, again, the orbital fat itself may not, may not be the, the marker. What we're trying to look at are the fibroblasts that are presumably making collagen and, and collagen production is the biologic signature of fibrotic right. disease. So it may not be as much a matter of whether it's the fat or the muscle. And in fact, because thyroid, because Graves' disease involves the whole body, you can probably find these some markers in every tissue in the body. Right. For example, one interesting thing is that the dermopathy gets, gets much better with tepertumumab also. We're seeing some features of that. So it, it's, there's it, probably not a, uh, a, a true predilection for one tissue type or one cell type over the other. I think that that's been an artifact of, of the fact that maybe there's just more fibroblasts in the muscles or they're more sensitive. I think we have to think about the disease more biologically than anatomically. Thank you. The next question is from Ayushi Agarwal. She is from New Delhi and she's currently a fellow with us in Hyderabad. She asks, how do you quantify fibrosis in your clinic? and do the Lee or the HES charts, FDT and extraocular motility or imaging, do they correlate with each other? They cor so in terms of the correlation, they correlate a little bit. And there's a, you know, there are some good studies. In fact, many of them were done by the Graves groups, by the IPTEDS and the UGOGO group, trying to uh, validate these studies. Uh, what, we, what we do in the clinic, we grossly measure binocular visual field, although we're looking into an automated binocular visual field test because that's my personal favorite because I think it's very useful functionally. We measure the ductions and I do that photographically just so that it's well documented. And we have a questionnaire for uh, functioning in terms of diplopia. I don't routinely do HES testing but I, yeah, I do like the HES test. Maybe we should, but we, we do those three questionnaire ductions and binocular single vision. Thank you. Savri, you had a question? Yeah. Um, uh, good morning there to you, Dr. Goldberg. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk and we were really looking forward to it. Uh, so over the last uh, maybe four to five years, we've also seen this uh, white-eyed kind of thyroid uh, um, you know, eye disease presentation pre predominantly between the uh, late 30s to early 50s. And, but the only thing that I found is that 
uh, and I wanted to know your experience was that they were a bit refractory in treatment with intravenous steroids. Um, they also, with a combination of immunosuppressives, didn't do too well. Um, and we actually, after actually having a bit of a discussion with Surya for one case, we did try uh, tocilizumab for two patients with uh, some amount of uh, improvement. But since the markers are no inflammation, uh, the end point becomes a little tricky in these cases. So what has your experience been when they present with such a white type disease? My experience is the same as yours. Uh, you know, treatment is not all that encouraging for these patients. You know, as I said, I, I, I think that tepertumumab may be the, the most encouraging medicine we try, but even that is not, is not perfect. You know, I, I think when we see these patients, we're just seeing a, 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 I don't think they're necessarily different. I think that they just are the most obvious patients to look at the fibrotic pathway because for whatever reason, you know, they're, they're just displaying that part of the disease. But I think that all patients with thyroid eye disease, you know, have some of these fibrotic pathways. So my, my guess is that there's, you know, the inflammatory pathway and the fibrotic pathway. And, you know, some patients manifest more one than the other, but I don't think it's a different disease when they're just fibrotic. I just think that their biology is manifesting that more obviously. So it allows us, it just makes us pay attention to that. But I think that's the same patient as the patient with a lot of inflammation in the fibrosis. And my argument is that you just, you don't pay that much attention to the inflammation, but just focus on the, the, the important point is the amount of fibrosis that's occurring. But I, so I don't think they're a different group of patients in that way, but they just point out how crummy our, our treatments for fibrosis are now. I don't have a great answer for it, it's frustrating. You're young, you should be studying this also. <laughs> Can I take uh, two more questions, uh, Kasturi? Yeah, please go ahead. So the next one is from Sahil Agarwal from All India Institute, New Delhi. Uh, Pallavi Sahil says hi to you, and he's very glad and happy that you are with Bob right now. And his question is that, what's your opinion about rituximab? They've just started to use that in thyroid patients. So we, we published a, a retrospective series when Kelvin Chong was our fellow on rituximab. And what we observed is that the, uh, the cast in particular, the inflammatory features responded very well. And a number of retrospective studies have shown that. There was one uh, prospective randomized study out of Mayo that was a little bit more discouraging in, in terms of rituximab. And in particular, I haven't seen any signal that rituximab is particularly good for the fibrotic disease. It does have a good safety profile that's going off label. So it'll be much less expensive pretty soon. And I think it's a reasonable steroid sparing immunosuppression, but I, I've seen no evidence that it's necessarily better than say tocilizumab or maybe even mycophenolate cell set. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. One more question from Dr. Richa Dharap. She is a fellow with us who's uh, finishing her training. She asked that you showed a case where fibrotic disease wasn't affected by orbital decompression. So do you think that the fibrotic disease can worsen or reactivate after surgery? I've certainly seen anecdotal cases where patients seem to develop worsening fibrotic disease after any kind of surgery, muscle surgery decompression. And if you look in the literature, there have been anecdotes. And biologically, you can, you, you can think of a reason because surgery certainly causes a lot of inflammation. And it's reasonable to think that maybe that, you know, sets off a, a cascade that eventually spills over into the fibrotic pathways. So the answer is yes, I've seen that anecdotally myself. And I, I think there's some rational explanation for it. Uh, and in fact, in patients that have bad fibrotic disease, 
I'm inclined to at least treat them aggressively with steroids perioperatively to try to reduce the uh, surgical inflammation. The last question is from Dr. Rolika Bansal from Hyderabad. She asks you, what's your take on relapse rate in cases managed with tepratumumab versus steroids? Uh, we don't have enough data right now to know that for sure. It's just starting to trickle in because uh, there's actually a, a national industry sponsor study right now to look at the long-term effects of tepratumumab. But anecdotally, you know, I, Kelsey, I'll let you answer that because you've been, you know, you, you've treated the most patients with tepratumumab in our clinic. What, what's your anecdotal experience now that you're seeing some of the two-year patients come in? Yeah, I think anecdotally it's quite variable, um, but some patients definitely do show a regression in their clinical features. It tends to happen, I would say, maybe six months after they finish treatment or roughly sort of seven half-lives of tepratumumab later. And I think, you know, the percentage, maybe it's 20 to 30%. I think it's not completely insignificant. Um, but Dr. Goldberg had made a great comment earlier that I think it depends partially, you know, perhaps where these patients are in Rundle's curve when you treat them and what their natural history otherwise would have been. So, and, you know, I think the same goes for steroids. So more data to come, and I think we'll have a better understanding, and possibly that'll lead to some modifications in the dosing regimen for tepratumumab, but I wouldn't be terribly right. surprised if that happens in the future. But I do think the honeymoon may be over. You know, our, our, <laughs> our dream that, you know, it'd be one treatment, and that's the end of it. It, it. it looks like at least for a group of patients, that's probably not true. There's a quick comment that has come from Gangadhar Sundar, who's logged in from Singapore. He asks you whether Tepro is just another drug joining the bandwagon, and what do you think is next? So, Ganga, I, that's actually a great question. Now, recognize I'm a little bit biased because it was our lab at UCLA that did the work on the IGF-1 <laughs> receptor, so we're particularly proud of it. But I really do think that the signals that we've seen from well-done studies are the most impressive I've ever seen in my career for thyroid eye disease. So I do think that it it represents at least a, a, a stairway step in our ability to treat the disease biologically. But the second part of your question is the most important, which is what's to come next, because it's still not perfect. And uh, to me, tepratumumab is just a, a step along the way, the story of trying to really understand the biology of the disease, get our best molecular biologists together and identify intervention points. And so hopefully, in the lifetime of some of the kids on the line here, we'll see even better biologic treatments. But, but I do think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true step in, in our ability to treat the disease. I'm pretty confident about that. Kasuri, we are done with the questions. You want to close? We are three minutes yeah. over time. Uh, so any more questions from any one of you or like, any questions from any of the panelists? Okay, so with this, we have come to the end of today's first lecture series. We are very much thankful to Professor Goldberg and we wish and to have you more in our future webinars and the series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Goldberg, Pallavi, and thank you everybody. And Kelsey, and Kelsey Roloff. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. It's so nice thank to you for you. having us. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pallavi. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Kelsey. Bye-bye. See you later, Melinda. So nice to see you all.